Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, here we are in the middle of July, and we still have yet to have a draft or free agency. As we've said all season, what an odd NHL season it is. As always, I'm Dan, alongside Matt. Matt, it's the 14th of July as we record this, and we are now getting ready for the NHL entry draft. I know. Usually, like, we're just wrapping up our thoughts on uh, the prospect camp over at Winsport and looking ahead to the summer and anything that the Flames need to address. And instead, we're looking ahead to who the Flames are going to draft this year. And, you know, looking back a little on any news around the league and Calgary specific, uh, congrats to the Tampa Bay Lightning for, well, beating the New York Islanders to win the Stanley Cup. <laughs> um, yeah, the the... The playoffs were weird this year. But, you know, you and I said going into the season, there was going to be an asterisk this year, right? Even if you were the Stanley Cup champ, it would be the, the asterisk year of, you know, one in a COVID year. So I yeah. think we all knew it was going to be weird. Yes, they, you know, they beat the Habs. We could debate all episode if we want to, if the Habs should have been there, but we have other things to talk about. So I think that, you know, next year, and that, that uh, Tampa team is going to have to be broken up and lose some players. So it'll be interesting to see what they can do next year with a full 82 game schedule yeah and i'm kind of glad that tampa repeated uh, just because you just have one big giant asterisk (laughs) instead of like two teams one one covid success yeah well matt let's jump right into flames news before we get to the two drafts coming up expansion and entry there is some other flames news we want to just quickly recap here uh, first, some roster news. So the Flames have lost two players. Uh, Nordstrom, Joachim Nordstrom, has signed in Russia, so won't be back next year. Alexander Yelison, who was uh, mostly on our AHL team, also signed in Russia. And the Flames have walked away from 2017 seventh-round selection Philip Svenningsen um, prior to the deadline to keep him or lapse his rights. So Svenningsen, if you looked at him, he was always a bit of a project. He never really found his niche as a pro in Sweden. Um, not. I don't think any of these guys are huge losses for the Flames organization. Yeah, the Flames need to get better at drafting Swedish forwards, um, especially considering this year's draft, where you know some of the people that we might be previewing are Swedish forwards. Uh, they the last guy that they actually got that hit was Michael Backlund, and you know when you're talking 14 years of drafts like that's kind of not so good i saw a funny tweet about that actually someone saying they weren't sure what sweden's swedish players were available late but we all know when buffalo made up a player in the draft and they said what if you just start combining names of ikea furniture and call those names in the seventh and eighth round and see if there's a guy named that if so he might be worth taking in round six or seven yeah well spending billy tried kind of like that yeah so, Spenningsen yeah, well, is close to that kind of a concept. So, um, And then looking ahead to some team awards as well, we had Johnny Goudreau receive the Daryl Doc Seaman Award for being the team's leading point scorer. Mikael Backlund received the Ralph and Sonia Skirfield Humanitarian Award for his work off the ice supporting several charities in the Calgary area. He's also previously been nominated for the NHL King Clancy Award for the same. And Mark Giordano uh, won the inaugural Clayton H. Riddle Award for the 2021-2021 season. That award is presented to the Flames defenseman who demonstrates throughout the regular season the greatest all-around ability at the position. And Elias Lindholm, the inaugural winner of the Harley N. Hotchkiss Award for the 2020-2021 season. The Harley N. Hotchkiss Award is presented to the player selected as the team's most valuable. So a lot of awards in this team with uh, initials. Our, our ownership here likes their initials. We've got the Clayton H. Carroll, the Harley N. Hotchkiss. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the next couple of years we start to see a Ken King Award added to that list. I would be shocked if there wasn't. And then the last piece of news before we get to our drafts is some changes to the Flames coaching staff. And Matt, I think I called this in our season wrap-up episode. I said I don't think Jelen will be back behind the bench next year. Then they'll find another job for him. Um, so I'm going to credit myself with that. That's a That was a prediction, even though it wasn't a predictions episode. The Calgary Flames have announced two new coaches. They brought in Kirk Muller as an associate 
coach. And Kale McLean has been promoted from Stockton AHL's head coach to an assistant coach. Former uh, assistant coaches Ray Edwards and Mart- Martin Jelena will not return to the coaching staff. Edwards will resume his role in player development, while Jelena also return- transition to player development operations. So if you remember, uh, Ray Edwards was not a coach. After the whole Bill Peters thing, he was brought into the coaching staff, I think more for numbers than anything. So returning to where he wants to be. Um, interesting, if you listen to Daryl Sutter talk about these guys, he said that he sees Kirk being the quote-unquote bench coach, the guy who will do a lot of Daryl's work on the bench and running the games and that sort of thing. So it makes you kind of wonder, what do we need the head coach for then? Um, and Kale will be doing the pre-scout and the headset work in the press box, so a lot of what we had Jelena doing. Matt, thoughts on I, these two I, additions I to think our staff? That, um, I think with um, what you mentioned about Muller, um, it's sort of like what Jim Playfair used to do under Daryl, where he was very much the X's and O's kind of guy and would write out the plays type of thing. But Daryl uh, very much is... His focus as the head coach is to push the buttons needed for the team to get going one way or another. And his job is the psychological side of the game where Kirk Muller is more the X's and O's kind of thing. And I can see here, too, them playing sort of good cop, bad cop, where Daryl's going to be the guy to run them hard in practice and motivate these guys, and then during the game, Kirk Kirk can be the good guy. Yeah, and Muller uh, being such a good center for all those years, I think that will help the Flames' face-off percentage quite a bit. Um, But, yeah, it's... I, I... I've always really liked Kirk Muller, even as a player. Uh, when uh, the Canadians won in 93, he was my favorite player on that team. Uh, so, yeah, it's just one of those, uh, you know, it's nice to see him in the organization, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do. And you and I have talked about how we think the Flames need to bring in more veteran NHL coaches. And if you look at Muller's coaching resume, this guy is definitely a veteran. He was most recently an associate coach with the Canadians from the 2016-2017 season right through February 2021. Uh, His second stint with the team. Before He was also an assistant with the Canadians from 2006-2007 until 2010-2011 before going on to be the head coach of the Hurricanes from 2011-12 through uh, 13 14. He spent two seasons as an assistant with the Blues in 14 15. So, uh, really, this is, you know, a guy who's got some NHL pedigree. And Matt, you and I talked about this when Daryl was brought in. Daryl's not a long term solution here. Who's next? This feels like we've got our next head coach, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think that in terms of um, Daryl, I think pretty much the main aspect of him coming in is to sort out because the flames look like a broken team with people all on their own page and um and you can see that where like the talent has for a number of years has outstripped the actual results and i think that uh daryl's main job is to sort that out and get everybody on that same page or you know transition people out if they don't actually have it in them to fit properly what was the deal in st louis when what was the last year that they had um oh who is their who is their coach that they had hitchcock and they he was not a head coach he was some other coaching advisor or something i could see that sort of becoming where daryl goes yeah it's one of those things that i think that um the hiring of Daryl more than anything was to sort out the organization sure. and see, but see once if they we... once they get sorted out and he rides off on the sunset, I think Muller becomes the new head coach. Yeah, probably. And then Kale McLean, you've probably heard that name. McLean, this is McLean's first NHL coaching position after three seasons with the AHL affiliate in Stockton. 
Uh, the 2021, 2020, 2021 season was his eighth season with the Flames organization, having served as an assistant with Abbotsford from 2011 through 13, two, th- two seasons the head coach of ECHL's Adirondack Thunder, and one season as an assistant in Stockton prior to becoming head coach. So, again, I'd say almost like uh, Huska, a very accomplished coach, and the more you can get those accomplished guys in the team, the better. And also a player just like Huska who knows a lot of our young guys. And I think that's really what the Flames want is these guys know, you know, Dubé, Godden, um, Shillington, a lot of these young guys that have come through our organization and the idea is that they might have a better uh, ability to work with them. Yeah, and I think that um, this team, it, even if they want to remain as like kind of uh, the playoff push type team, they're still going to have to transition more young guys into the lineup more so than normal and like you're going to start seeing guys like Ruzitska and Pospisil and Phillips and you know even on the blue line a few other guys come up just to you know like Shillington getting more of a full-time gig and like all that kind of stuff and I think that uh, having coaches that are more able to help in the transition to the NHL and allow them to learn the pro game and ease them into it uh, with somebody who is experienced like Daryl will help on the overall. And then because Kale McLean got uh, brought up to the Flames, that means we're missing a head coach for the Stockton Heat, who are expected to play in Stockton again next year. Um, and the Flames didn't waste much time filling that position. We've had that position filled. It's been filled now by Mitch Love. He's 37, product of BC. Uh, he's really taken what was not much of a playing career and made a very impressive coaching career. He played five seasons as a defenseman in the dub, suiting up for Moose Jaw, Swift Current, and Everett. He went pro in 2005 and was in the AHL the same time Gio was. Gio was with Omaha and Love was with Lowell. Uh, he played a solid. He was kind of a, an AHL everyday guy, but never spectacular enough to get an NHL look, really. And he played for Lowell, Albany, Lake Erie, Houston, and Paroya of the AHL, as well as John's, Johnstown and Boys, Boys Port. Uh, I don't even know how to say it. Boys Year Shreveport before retiring in 2011. So he was a pro for six years. Immediately transitioned to coaching, where he caught on as assistant in Everett. And he was there from 2011 to 2018. He moved on to Saskatoon in 2018, serving three seasons as head coach with the Blades. And he's a master good resume with Hockey Canada, coaching twice as an assistant in the uh, U- U-17 Challenge, the Holinka Gretzky Cup, and the World Juniors. So, really, it sounds like another upcoming young coach, right? And I wouldn't be surprised if he's also being groomed to one day make it to the NHL. But based on this coaching resume and the fact he's 37, fairly young guy, a lot of room to grow in the organization. It sounds like a guy who's got pedigree in developing players, especially coming from the dub. Oh, for sure. And uh, uh, there's nothing really to say other than he is on the right trajectory. And Saskatoon's got a good program, so if he's been coaching there. Yeah, exactly. It, it, you're on the right trajectory if you're – you know, 37 and already an AHL head coach. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how he does with the Heat and look forward to seeing how it goes. I think there's some teams that are more serious about winning at the AHL level, and I think Calgary's really just trying to beef up their development program. And I think that this sounds like a great coach. I don't know a lot about Mitch Love, but from what I've read and what I've seen players say about him, he sounds like the right guy to lead our development program. Yeah. Well, Matt, with that, shall we get to the, I guess, the two main events here, the uh, the double E's, the expansion and the entry draft? Yeah, fun times on both counts. So let's talk about the calendar, because the calendar is a little bit weird for the NHL. On July 21st is the expansion draft. Teams have to submit their protection list on the 17th, which will give uh, Seattle time to decide who they want to take. I haven't seen it confirmed if the league will reveal those lists before the 21st or not. I'm hearing both. I don't know if you've seen anything confirmed, Matt. No. Um, Because I know they're doing a big, like, TV event on the 21st, so I'm kind of thinking they're going to want to keep the lists secret and unveil them then. But yeah, because they didn't really with Vegas, so I don't know. No, they got leaked, but there was never – I don't think you'd go to NHL.com and see who got taken. 
or who yeah. got sort of protected. Um, and then the 21st is the actual draft. July 23rd, my birthday, is the NHL entry draft. And then July 28th is when we open free agency. So let's go back to the start of that list, and let's start with the expansion draft coming up on the 21st. It's the 14th as we record this, so we're seven days away, one week away from the expansion draft. And, Matt, I think you and I would both agree that the Flames have two options. They can do a 7-3 and, and one, or sorry, um, yeah, 7-3-1. So seven forwards, three defensemen, one goaltender, or 8-1 and one for their protection list. I think we were both under the uh, impression they're going to go 7-3-1. and one. Yeah. Uh, frankly, it would be kind of stupid for the team to go 4-4 uh, four and four to keep uh, Mark Giordano, like it's, um, it's one of those things that like at at that rate, then you're ex- either exposing like one of uh, Kachuk, Monahan, back um, Gaudreau or Lindholm, or you're exposing Manjapane or Dubé. Like it, it just makes zero sense to go four and four. So let me read through what, if I was the GM here, I'd submit as my protection list, and you tell me if I'm off base or if you do the same. We really don't have a lot of guys we can protect, so I think this is kind of the the obvious list. But for forwards, we would have Goudreau, Monaghan, Kachuk, Dubé, Lindholm, Mangiapane, Backlund. Yeah. For, uh, def- for defense, we'd have Anderson, Hannafin, Tanev. And, of course, in goal, we have Markstrom. Yep, yeah, that would be my list entirely. So leaving so the, leaving those guys protected then, I mean, you look at who's unprotected, the big name, and you've said all season, Mark Giordano, all right? And I think at this point, if you look at the Flames roster, it's obvious they're going to take Geo. Yeah, it, it, uh, and, you know, like I, I never like to see uh, things lost for nothing. And, you know, like the Flames, if they were to trade Giordano, they could get something decent for... Like, look at the Duncan Keith trade. Like, you can get something actually viable for that. Uh, but it, unless uh, the Flames make a trade with Seattle to not take Giordano, and it would have to be something fairly decent, I'm assuming. Uh, probably a second round pick or something like that. Uh, like and at, is at, that price uh, worth it? And in my mind, absolutely not. So, you know, I think it's one of those where you just have to bite the bullet and it's going to suck. Uh, and you never know. Seattle might not want to take Geo's cap hit and they might prefer to say uh, select like Matthew Phillips or Oliver Shillington or sign Derek Ryan. According to, but, my, according to my math here, Phillips still has 26 games until he's eligible. Okay. So I the, wasn't sure. The other f- I've, I've heard on both ends on that one. So that's the, why. the players that are eligible that would be unprotected would be Derek Ryan, who you and I have talked about it. There's some logic to them taking Ryan because he's from the uh, the area. So sort of like um, when, they, when Vegas took um, England from us because he was from the area, that might make some sense. And he's a UFA, so you can negotiate out whatever deal you want. They could take a real winner in Josh Levo. Or Brett Ritchie or Dominique Simone. Now, if you and I can be sitting here after the draft and say, wow, we we had to pay the big price of Brett Ritchie, I think the Flames are laughing in this draft. Yeah, I think the Flames really aren't losing much with either of the expansion drafts. Like, as much as it would suck to see Mark Giordano leave, like, at the end of the day, he's a 38-year-old yeah. defenseman. And like, then on de- on defense, we have Shillington, Stone, and Nesterov. And again, if you want to take one of those guys, great. Yeah. But, you know, even if Stone gets taken, they'll find some way to bring him back. You'll leave, you'll come back. I mean, they'll, you know, trade a oh, yeah, seventh exactly. to bring him back. We've talked about him. He's a defenseman that can't stay away, right? We, tr- we pay exactly. him to go away, and we pay him to bring him back. Yep. Um, but I think... I mean, as much as we look at Shillington as a great prospect, I think every team's going to have a Shillington unprotected. Right? Oh, yeah, for sure. Some sort of tweener guy. So they're not going to want to take all the tweeners. And you're right. I think Giordano I think Giordano is the obvious choice unless they don't want the cap hit. And I think you've been confident all season that Giordano would get taken. And I think he'll be exposed. 
I didn't know if he could take it. I think especially now as we're starting to see some big buyouts happen. I could see Seattle loading up with some salary before the draft happens. Maybe bring in Parise or Suter. And maybe then they don't want to be taking on more old, uh, you know, big money. Yeah, it really depends on uh, what the actual expansion lists are for all the teams. Because, yeah. you know, like... It, it, when it came time for Vegas, like some of the players that were exposed to them, it's like, uh, I guess we have to take somebody, uh, Griffin Reinhardt, um, you know, where it's just like, uh, yeah, that's a body. Sure. And yeah, well, you're right. And, and if he's, you know, the best body available, they're going to take him. But I think looking at a yeah. lot of the protection lists, I think everybody's going to have one overpaid vet. And everybody's going to have one tweener guy like Shillington. Yeah. And there are some teams that are going to actually be hurt by it. And some that, like Edmonton, that are not going to be hurt at all. And it, it's one of those that uh, you, you just have to look at uh, just raw talent uh, that would be exposed. And I think that Giordano uh, would be one of the better players on that list. Um but, you know, and especially, like, if, I'm not expecting Seattle to replicate Vegas' success. Uh, so, um, having uh, Giordano being a, an older veteran guy and a soon-to-expire contract, uh, that might just look good for Seattle in that, hey, we can flip him at the trade deadline for insert draft pick here. I think that's the big thing there. Another name I think could be available, and I think you could see them pick between them. If you had to pick Mark Giordano or Shea Weber, who do you take? Uh, I'd take Weber, but um, Weber's Weber, got, uh, I think, four years left at 7 8. So I don't know if you want to take on a 35 year old with that many years. Yeah, uh, Weber's also has some injuries, and his career might be hosted. Um, so we'll see. Uh, yeah. So, and, and, you know, I mentioned this on, in our last episode at last season, is I think that if the Flames are trying to change the culture, and I hate to say it because I love Gio as a player, I think he's a decent captain, maybe moving on from that established player. He's the longest-serving Flame. He's the only guy here, you know, that we still remember from our 4 run, that sort of thing. Maybe moving on from him is the way to change the culture um, and, you know, put the C on somebody new and, and that sort of thing. So... Matt, if we say that Geo is the worst case scenario, what's your realistic best case scenario for the expansion draft? Uh, Derek Ryan getting signed. I would agree. Uh, like, a, it, uh, realistically, if they don't take Giordano, then it, it would come down to which they prefer of Derek Ryan or Oliver Shillington. In which case, okay. Well, I, th I think if you're wanting to win now, you would want to bring in Ryan, who's 34, and you know what you've got. Shillington's still unproven at the NHL level, and I think there's a lot of those guys like Shillington who are UFAs or RFAs. You can find them. Fair I, there's going to be other teams that are going to have them exposed. Yeah, exactly. And it's one of those where, okay, you know, like it, it's if the, that's who Seattle took it would I be going oh I'm really mournful of that being uh, I'd be like no of course you have mm. to lose something and it would be unfortunate but you know you have to lose something what do you think Calgary doing a deal with a team that's not Seattle before the expansion draft to move Geo what do you think the probability is uh, some possibilities, because not everybody has three good defensemen. Um, what do you look and, at for return? Do you think we get a fair return, or does the other GM say, you're between a rock and a hard place, here's a sixth? Uh, I, I would expect it to be along the lines of the Duncan Keith-ish return. Okay, and so you're thinking we don't retain any salary there either? No. Maybe we move him to Edmonton and we give him two overpriced defensemen. Hey! <laughs> two overpriced 38-year-olds. Yes. Uh, you remember, you yeah, remember those like, old guys on the Muppets, the hecklers in the balcony? That could be these guys, just two old guys. Just sit there and beak at the forwards on what to do. Yeah. God, you guys are so bad. <laughs> um, what do you... Th so let's just say we go with what you said earlier, which is do a deal for 
um, Vegas or for Seattle not to take Geo, and let's say it's a second or a third, do you pay that price? Honestly, if it was a third round pick to like say Edmonton's third that we got for uh, the Lucic trade, if that's what it ended up being to keep Geo, sure. I pay a third, not a second. Yeah, a second, no. Uh, yeah, like that That would be... No, just use the $6 million on somebody else. And I think that's the benefit here that we don't look at is Giordano's making $6.75 million. Um, the only guy making more than him on the team is Matthew Kachuk. We're looking to re-sign uh, Goudreau, and we have some needs, as we've talked about, and we won't get into them now, but uh, right-wingers especially. So I think that you know it's both a blessing and a curse. It'll be sad to see Gio go, but I think it does open up a lot of cap room that we can do something else with. Yeah, and if you look at uh, with like losing Riddick and Bennett and you know some of the buyout uh, previously ending and 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 um, the Flames are going to have quite a bit of cap room to add some people if and it's six point seven five million dollars more if Giordano gets claimed and you know you don't want to lose assets for nothing but you know in the cap world the the money itself is a huge asset and that 6.75 million dollars that's a first line forward Mm -hmm. or that's a first pairing defenseman like you know so you know and if you look at it like uh say you get like the equivalent of like a taylor hall type of thing and view it in that perspective of oh well you lost Giordano but you got like a player like to trade then yeah Giordano yeah. for a Taylor Hall or a Jack Eichel or somebody like that yeah and then at that rate does that actually make sense to you mm. at, which yeah of course because player age and all of that it just does and so we talked yeah. about the eight and one model. My best guess if the Flames are going to do eight and one. And again, tell me if you do this differently. You have to protect Markstrom. You would then, if you wanted to protect Geo, you would go Hannafin, Anderson, Tanev, Geo on the back end, and probably Goudreau, Lindholm, Kachuk, Monjapani on the front, which would expose Backlund, Dubé, and Monahan, and you're guaranteed to lose one of those three, probably Monahan. Yeah, which that's why it would be really stupid. So like you're. It. Yeah, I mean, Monaghan, I think even if we want to move on from Monaghan, there's more value to him than there is to Geo on the trade market. Yeah, like, Monaghan you can get a good forward for. Mm-hmm. Or or first-round pick, or other things. Like, you know, he's not trash. <laughs> you mm. know, like, you're he's not 38 years old. You know, he's the best... Uh, second best player for, in terms of offensive production from his draft year like you know like that's he's a good player still and yeah he's got injury troubles he's still a good player the only other thing i think the flames could do if we go back to the 731 model is uh, protect giordano hannafin anderson and leave tanev um unprotected there's as much as i don't want to lose tanev i think if you look at it logically, and I'm not saying they should do this, but just exploring all angles, you can probably find an equivalent to Tanev as a UFA this year. Yeah, possibly. You know, a similar type of defenseman um, for similar money you can probably find as a as a UFA. So if they really want to keep Gio around, that would be the only other way I can see doing it because you're not going to put Hannafin out there. You're not going to put um, Anderson out there. No, because insta claim. Um, and, and again, I'm. We think that they'd automatically take Tanev, but again, at four four and a half million, it's a good deal. Um, but it would depend if Seattle's looking to beef their roster up or get a bunch of guys they can flip. And because he's under a deal till 2024, they might not want to take on that long of money. Yeah, uh, to me, um, I would easily take Tanev over Giordano. So. Um... Yeah, I, I, it's one of those that the expansion draft just sucks. We're gonna lose a good player regardless, and uh, you know I, I would rather go with the thirty-eight year old than anyone younger. I'm just looking at UFAs last year made similar money to Tanev, and if there's anyone I'd want to replace him with, 
Ryan Murray, Jason Demers, Brennan Smith, Ian Cole, David Savard, Adam Larson, Alec Martinez, Eric Goodbranson. Like, they're all just marginal defensemen. Uh huh. Maybe Ryan Murray. He's the youngest of the group at 27. Uh, or, yeah, or Larson. But I think Larson's going to get a big payday. Um, but yeah, no one, no one that I would say could step in and fill that role right away. Maybe Neil Pionk with the right partner, but that would be about it. Yeah. So yeah, I think as sad as I am as a Flames fan to lose Gio, I think it's a logical guy to leave unprotected. And I think it's, I don't know if it makes sense for Seattle to take him. Like we don't know what we don't know what Ron France's strategy is, but I can't see anybody else, like you said, except for Ryan, just because he's the hometown guy. You don't take Ryan in any other scenario. If this was um, Kansas City expanding, they don't want Ryan. They'll sign him as a free agent if they want him. But because it's Seattle and because Derek Ryan is from Washington, that's the only other thing I think could happen. Uh-huh. He's from Spokane, which isn't too far away. So... But I hate to say it, Matt. I think we. I think number five is on its way out. Yeah, and it, it's nobody's preferred situation. I. I don't think there's a Flames fan that w- would actively like to see Giordano just be given away. But you know, it, it is the situation, and and you know, and I think, like I said earlier, I think they can use it to sort of sell a new, a new era. Yeah. Right, we're making some changes, we're moving some guys. Who do you put the C on if Gio leaves? Uh, Milan Lucic. I agree. I said that last year. I got a lot of flack for it. I stand by it. He doesn't have to be your, your captain forever, but I think at least for one year is a veteran guy. He's your transitional champ until someone younger is ready. Yeah, sort of like uh, when Steve Smith was the co- or captain of the Flames. Like, you know, just the veteran guy. I also don't want them to do the Capo thing, which I can. A lot of expansion teams do, which we have no captain. We have you know three alternates, and it's like, well, you can't be an alternate if there's no one you're alternating for. Um, or what the Flames have done in the past, where they had a home captain and a road captain back in the '80s. Yeah, I think Lucic is the obvious choice. No. Yep. Ah, well, we'll see what happens on the 21st. I have a feeling that between the 21st and the 23rd, which is entry draft day, I think there's going to be a flurry of activity on the 22nd. I think that's going to be a really busy day once teams know who's been who's who's been claimed and who hasn't. I think we're going to see a whole crap ton of trades. Yeah, because it's like, okay, now we can... The gloves are off. Now we can actually address the needs that we have. And, and blah, I think blah, blah, that's blah. when you'll see first round picks traded and stuff too once teams know who they lose then they know what they've got to secure Mm -hmm. so let's jump into the entry draft the entry draft two days later like i said on my birthday the 23rd of july usually not a an important hockey day for me at uh you know mid mid july usually it's like oh we've signed tobias reader because he's still available but huge day this year um before we talk about some specific players let's talk about the picks the flames have and then their overall draft philosophy so this year we have um, we have picks in the first round at number 12, our pick. We have the 44th overall pick in the second round, the 76th overall pick in the third round, the 83rd overall pick in the third round, which was from the Edmonton Lucic deal. We have no fourth round pick because we traded that to L.A. for Forbort. In the fifth round, we have the 140th pick. In the sixth round, we have the 172nd pick, or 172nd, yeah, and uh, round seven, 204. So we pretty much have our pick in every round except for round four, which we've upgraded to a third round pick. So seven picks still. Uh, Remember, this is a weird draft because the numbering doesn't make sense. The Flames were assigned the 13th pick in every round of the draft after the first, but there's only 31 picks in the first since Arizona had to forfeit their first, so every other pick moves up by one which is kind of confusing. But, yeah, we pretty much have our pick in every round. Um, So, Matt, before we talk about individual players, what do the Flames need? What type of players do we need out of this draft? Well, that's the uh, the crux of the problem. The Flames need scoring, speed, defense, goaltending, right-wingers, centers, this feels Basically, like the year that we just need to stock the shelves, doesn't it? 
yeah, like, we don't need a left winger. That's basically it. But unfortunately, like, all the good players for forwards are pretty much left shot left wingers. As so. much as we say we need right wingers, though, I'm not looking for one of these players to jump right in the NHL. So I, no. I, I don't think we're looking to fill immediate need. But when we look at the Flames' overall prospect pool, I mean, you know, we've got, you know, Emilio Pedersen, Connor Zari, Jacob Peltier, um, you know, Martin Pospisil, Zav Garodny. On defense, we got nobody. Like I think this is a huge year to uh, to look at defense. We've got Jonas Kinnevel and Kuznetsov, Petrovic, Lerby, Pullman. Like we just, I think we just need to fill. Spots. Yeah, Poirier is also there. Um, yeah, like the the Flames. Like I could see them drafting a number of defensemen in this draft, just not necessarily with the first round pick. Yeah. And I think that this is a year that we're going to have a lot of open roster spots. And I think some of the roster spots that we used last year to fill with Levo, with, um, you know, Nordstrom, that sort of thing, I think you can fill internally with some of your guys like uh, Tulola, uh, Ruzhishka. So I think that we just need to get new bodies. And obviously some of these guys aren't going to be ready to play in the HL right away. But I think we just need to get guys in at every position. I think this is just a, a reset year. Yeah. And I could see some guys like Peltier pushing and, you know, Phillips and uh, Patterson. It just, yeah, this year I think is going to be a big transition year. And, like, I wouldn't be opposed to the Flames going out and signing a veteran player or two in the same Levo-ish mold, but have them more as, like, the 13th, 14th guys and, and leave the competition up for the kids to earn the spots. And I think one be. I think one argument for that is just because if we pull some of those uh, top guys out of the farm, we have so little depth. So I think we have some guys here, like I would say a guy like, um, you know, Pospisil who, or even Rajishka, who could still learn some of the HL level for another year. They don't need a, to go NHL yet. Yeah, I could see that. So, so I think, yeah, this is a year to, and when I'm looking at drafting, I'm always looking two, three years out. Like it's very rare, especially in this organization that a top guy goes pro the next year. So we're looking at kind of two, three years out before they're even in the A and probably four or five till the NHL. Yeah. And that's where, uh, like you look at Pelte and Zari, for example, like very highly thought of players and yet like they're still like just going to be going into the AHL and still you know like it, it's gonna be a bit and mm-hmm. that's a good thing uh, no need to rush so right now we have the 12th pick Matt last year we saw the Flames trade down not once but twice um, they got the players so nice so we trade down for them twice what do you think there's value this year in let's let's break this down to two possible scenarios do you think there's value in Moving the twelfth round pick for a veteran, let's say, and getting out of the first round. Well, the the problem is is that because this year's draft is so chaotically random that I don't see there being any value really in the draft picks themselves. Um, uh, like honestly, I would be shocked if you got more than like a number four defenseman for the pick number twelve. And I think you're backed up with that by looking at the trade deadline, right? Most of the, the the draft picks that were traded were in next year's draft. Yeah, and because like half of the players didn't play, or if they did, they played a very small amount, and like everything was just chaotic. Like it's hard to gauge any of these players properly, and you know, like it, basically the only guys that have any. Uh, staying power in terms of uh, where they're rated is like did they basically continue to play at a reasonably similar level to last year and I think to listening to some junior player or some junior coaches talk not just their playing ability but did they stay in shape and a lot of junior coaches said that's what they think is going to be a big factor in this year's draft yeah and it's really tough for 
because this situation being so unprecedented like i just i don't see any value in trading picks for players because like as a if i was a gm i would not want to trade a valuable player for no. draft picks in this draft and i don't think you'll see them trade up or down for that reason either i think everyone's probably able to find something at where they are in the first round and i don't know that there's value in moving up or down yeah, and then on top of it, this draft is basically very similar to the 2012 draft where the guys at the top were kind of not very good and then the rest of the draft is also kind of not very good. Um, so it's kind of difficult for teams to, you know, like, uh, put it this way, like, I would not trade Sean Monahan for the number one overall pick. My assessment of this draft going in is this is probably not the draft where we find the next Goudreau, the next Monaghan, the next Kachuk, but this is probably the draft where we find the next third and fourth line guys in our team. This is probably a great draft to build up a bunch of bulk, if that makes sense. Just pick yeah. guys you think have some raw potential and see yeah. what happens. Yeah, like if, like honestly, I view this draft as a win if you get two NHL players that can play more than fourth line third pairing minutes you know and like it, it, as long as you're getting a body out of the de deal i think that can actually contribute to your team to me that's a win yeah i think you're probably right there i, I would say more than fourth line minutes but yeah i think that you're looking at probably just because of the players not having played and not being able to see a lot of them and guys that probably should have had a turning point in their season or a you know a turning point season not having that i think um you know probably yeah probably hard to scout so i think as long as you get one or two bodies that going forward can play at the nhl level for less than a million for let's say a full season i think that's going to be successful for you yeah and if you actually find money and get a good one well hey that's amazing it's found money then right yeah, but, it's but just I like think... it's like Vasilevsky for Tampa, mm -hmm. you know. Like he was in that 2012 draft, and you know he was the only good player in that draft, really, in the first round. So, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, for Tampa that was very much found money. Every team's got it, right? Every team's got one yeah. or two guys. I mean, you could say that Goudreau in the fourth round is found money. Oh yeah, for sure. Right. Well, even uh, Manjapane, too, in the sixth. Like, you know, just guys that came out of nowhere to be serviceable NHL talent. And uh, instead of, like, a normal draft year where you're looking at, like, oh, well, this guy has the expectation of, you know, this guy's going to be a middle six forward or a top six forward. You know, it's like, hey, can he actually play a game? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and that's more the level of expectations for this draft. Well, let's jump into some of the players here. You and I have uh, picked some players. You picked most of these guys, and there's a lot of them I had on my list as well. But let's profile some players that might be available with the number 12. We're not going to assume the Flames moving up or down in any of these, um, or at least not by much, maybe one pick, two picks. But we're expecting they'll draft between, let's say, 10th and 14th. Is that reasonable? Yeah. And, like, uh, uh, with this draft, there's seven or eight guys that, should go in the top seven or eight like there it's pretty much a tier up there and then everybody else in a very random but with how everything is so random you could easily see one two or three random guys that are further down jump up and like, I could see a team, like, if, say, the one goalie, Jesper Wallstead, goes in the top six, and you have a team drafting seventh or eighth that wants a goalie, uh, I could see them going for Sebastian Casa, even though he's not rated to go until, like, 15 to 20. The guys so. I think you might go see go early are guys that either, let's say, like, the Hitmen, who played a condensed WHL season in Calgary's building in the Flames building, I think they might have got a better look at them, or guys who weren't playing but were working out in the area and you could go look at them in person. So I think there's going to be one or two surprises because of that. But like you were saying with, you know, guys being 
maybe going out of order. And we'll look at this with the first couple. This first guy that you have on our list, he's rated uh, by Bob McKenzie, potentially number two, and by McKean's Hockey at number 11. Like, that's quite a jump. Um, even, um, you know, recruit scouting has him at number 14. So there's a whole range this year, more than usual, about where guys might go. But let's jump into this first guy. Yeah. Uh, this, this is a player that you uh, put on our list. He's an 18-year-old defenseman from Sweden. Uh, last year played uh, in the SHL, so playing in a, in a men's league. And this is Simon Edmondson. What do we know about Edmondson? He's a six foot five defenseman, big kid. What else do we know about his game? Uh, the player that he reminds me a little bit in terms of Flames players is Yusuf Valimaki, but not nearly as dynamic of a player as Yusuf Valimaki. So, uh, with his size and skating ability, like I would assume that he would make the NHL and play in the NHL, but I do not think he has the higher end upside like he he's a decent two-way defenseman it just like when uh viewing valimaki at the same age like there was a special something with him like his shot was better than edvinson's your note and here just, says boring tall defenseman yeah uh, basically and but you know he's you need, okay you need boring defensemen again if we're not looking to draft our top let's say four Sometimes you need boring defensemen in your bottom three. Yeah, six, and I think five, that, six, and seven. Yeah, I think that he profiles more as a four-five guy uh, if he makes the NHL. And realistically, like if the Flames walked away with him, that would be okay. And I, I'd give the pick a C because it's safe and it's boring. And the guy, he will make the NHL more than likely. Like, I would pretty much, due to his height and his skating ability and his just overall awareness, he should make the NHL. I just, I don't see the upper, upper end with him at all. Do you think that he's going to get more opportunity than maybe he should, whether that means more NHL looks or maybe a you know longer time in the AHL because of his height? Yeah, definitely. I think we even saw that with guys like Kanzig, who probably got more opportunities because of their height. Yeah, like honestly, if Kanzig was say six foot three and so six foot seven, I don't even think he gets drafted. So, um, so one of the write-ups I saw about uh, Edvinson here: tons of raw talent in his game, directs pucks to the net well for rebounds and tips. He's decisive in transition and excellent puck carrier who moves with his head up. His wingspan is the difference maker when it comes to forcing the opponents to the perimeter of the zone. So like you said, sounds like, I mean, kind of what you look for in a in a generic defenseman. But I think that his size, like you said, probably going to get him a look somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and like I, I would assume that he would make the NHL just because of his size. I just don't see him having enough in the tank in terms of specialness to make an impact beyond being a filler guy. Yeah, and, and you know what? There's, I mean, there's livings to be made being a filler guy. Oh, for sure. Uh, well, let's look at another guy on this list, your next pick, and this is Chaz Lucius, who plays for the University of Minnesota in the NCAA uh, starting next year. He has been playing for the U.S. National Junior Team um, this past season in the USHL, so turning going to college next year. He's an 18-year-old centerman. Six foot, 172 pounds from Grant, Minnesota. Um, puts up decent numbers at the USHL level. Last year in a shortened season in 12 games, he played 18. He had 18 total points. And if we go back the year before that, he played 32 games, got 22 points. Um, what, what do you want to tell us about Chaz Lucius? Well, uh, with all of these players, it's not so much my picks as uh, just guys that are rated in the general area for where the Flames are picking. Um, but uh, Chaz Lucius, uh, he's pretty much like your standard, typical, average-ish guy that you would, in a normal year, you'd see drafted 23, 24, 25 overall, and then that's the last you ever hear of them. Um, there's, I have never seen any dynamic otherness to him, uh, where, like, where it stops you dead. Like, oh, this guy's doing something different. 
Uh, with him, he he's reliable in all the ways, and it just it leaves you wanting more. And especially for a pick like the twelfth overall selection, you really should be getting something more there. But we've already said this is not a great year. Yeah. Right. I think. I think when we're looking at first round picks this year, we have to kind of compare them to what you might get in the second round other years. And from what I've seen about Lucius, a lot of people say that he's got some high octane offense. He's a good problem solver, a threat with the puck. I think he might have enough. And I haven't watched him extensively, but from what I've seen and heard, he has enough tools that he can play a lot of different roles. And for a guy who might be a fill-in guy or someone who, um, you know, who might need to come in as a second, you know, third line guy, those guys who can adapt to whatever role they're put in are often the most valuable. Yeah, if this was, if we were talking about like a late first round pick or a second round pick, I would be, yeah, this guy's got enough. Mm-hmm parts where if he takes those next steps he might be something it's just for pick number 12 yeah you're expecting no. more yeah exactly like uh, frankly I think it, issue is his speed you know it's one of those where like if the that was the best guy available at 12 i'd either try to trade down just to get additional assets or try to trade the pick outright because you, you know, and at that rate, like, get an NHL body, <laughs> mm-hmm. because that would be more valuable to you than, you know, for the value of the 12th overall selection. He's rated everywhere from 9th to 17th by some of the various ra- uh, draft rankings. So, yeah, I mean, probably that kind of middle tweener guy, but I agree with you. I feel like there's better. I think from what I've seen and heard, uh, his speed could be the issue. Uh, a lot of people think he has below NHL speed, and that could be the issue uh, going forward with him. Yeah. Uh, the next guy here, and a guy that I really like too, you profiled this guy. He uh, he played for the Sioux Falls Stampede last year in the USHL. He's played for the Mesnat Tigers um in in the dub in 2018 2019 2019 20 and this is the son of an nhler who usually i don't know usually when you get second generation guys that turn out okay the son of nhler cole sillinger or sorry mike sillinger this is cole sillinger he's a centerman 18 years old from columbus six foot 201 pounds he's been ranked everywhere from number 10 to number 20 in various different uh rankings what do you like about cole sillinger uh, he has offensive skill, um, he, he, that, and he, he can score. Um, that's about where my praise of him would end. Um, the player that he reminds me the most of uh, is actually Hunter Shinkarik. Um He has a bad, bit of a bad attitude. Um, he's overly self-centered um, and boisterous when he scores. And he tends to look shot first instead of utilizing his line mates. And the fact that he's not a very quick player, that usually is a recipe for somebody who is a good score at the AHL level and never actually transitions to the NHL. From what I've seen of Sillinger, his game seems very one-dimensional. He seems like Jerome, where he's great in the offensive zone, but as soon as he's out of there... He's no good to you. And, and I think for a guy who's probably not going to end up being a star player on any team, I don't know that you can grow at the NHL level with that unless they could teach him to do something else. But I think, um, you know, it's – I think he'd almost have the Sam Bennett problem where Bennett, Bennett was a star player in junior, came to the NHL, couldn't play that game, and we had to train him to, you know, play a different role. And I don't know that of all these guys, I think Sillinger's a lot more raw talent than – or let's say raw potential than refined talent, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that uh, he has more of like the flashy skill that you would be hoping for. It the thing that just really concerns me is it's the exact problem that Hunter Shinkarik had. He just didn't have the foot speed, and uh, you know, like if he was quicker. 
I honestly I think Sillinger probably goes in the top three in this draft. Um but I can see somebody taking him because of his pedigree. Yeah, and I could see him going higher than expected because of his pedigree. Um like he I could just, see him going in the top eight. It's I can he, I can see him go in the top ten. I just don't know if he's the guy I want in the Calgary Flames organization of this list. No, me either. I'm looking yeah. at this list, and there's still two forwards I want a lot more than him. So when I'm looking at this list, I yeah would for me pass there's twelve. Yeah, for me there's three forwards on this list and two goalies that I'd rather have. Um, so I think you know a twelve at at thirty. 28, 29, 30, 31. Yeah, I'd probably take Sillinger. 12, I think he got a pass. Yeah, if you, you know, like, looking back to the Shin Carrick draft, like, if the Flames took him at 23, like, where the Flames yeah. took Poirier, fine, sure. But, you know, 12, that that's a different beast, you know. And it just, to me, the value isn't there for the pick and it, it, you, I, there's too many other players that have other parts of their game that are good i was gonna say two more guys who i think and, and in a year when we haven't been able to scout a lot i think guys who we would better know what we're gonna get than cylinder exactly uh the next player you put on our list uh carson lambos he's a defenseman 18 years old from winnipeg he now plays in winnipeg for the winnipeg ice um, he's six foot one, two hundred and one pounds. He uh, projects to go everywhere from eleventh through thirty first. So people all over the place in this kid. What do What do you want to tell us about Lambos? Uh, another okay defenseman. Um, not going to blow you away. Serviceable and very similar thoughts uh, with. Uh, the other guy, uh, Edvinson, where not a top end guy, I I don't think. Uh, better than, uh, in like a little bit more dynamic offensively than uh, what Edvinson is, but still, yeah, it's it's hard. Um, like this... uh, th- none of the defensemen, like this isn't a normal. Def- draft for defensemen where like you're, you're seeing like a guy like a Josh Morrissey around where we are which is roughly where he got selected I think he was the 12th overall pick uh, when he was drafted like there's nobody on that tier uh, like I, honestly with this draft I think Luke Hughes would be the closest to Josh Morrissey um, and he's supposed to go in the top three like it, it, it just you're looking at more of a this guy should make the NHL. He he's kind of like a little bit like TJ Brody in that like he doesn't have the booming shot, but he his skating's good. He can pass. It, it it's the generic Flames type draft pick. Like when you look back to like Brett Kulak and Ryan Culkin and uh, uh, Rasmus Anderson and Oliver Shillington, like that generic type of slick skating smoothish defenseman who can kind of do everything it, some of them turn out some of them don't it it would be very much in that line but you know there's just not enough there to make me go oh at 12 this is a must pick guy the best scouting report i saw on lambos is good edges and lateral motion that lets him confront puck carries high in the offensive zone adjust his pivots to speed is something good and something not Good skater, but needs to work on puck protection and explosiveness in the transition. Backward skating relies on shallow C cuts with a very wide base. Physical player, but uses hands too much in one-on-one battles. Excellent shooting skill and display in the WHL. But as you said in the past, WHL doesn't always convert to NHL. I think Lambos, like like what you were saying with Culkin and some of those guys, I think you could probably have a pro career, whether that's an NHL career or not. I don't know yet. Yeah, it again. It it's one of those situations where is that the best use of number twelve? To me, no. No, and you know, I mean, even if we go back a couple of years, you know, when the Flames fell out of the first and took Anderson in the second, Anderson's turned into a great pick for us. You know, a great player and good use of that pick, but not someone I probably would have picked in the first. So if 
Carson Lambos yeah. falls to our second pick at 44, sure, take Perfect. him. Yeah, like if the, we were even picking, say, 25th or 26th, yeah, sure, definitely. It's just for where it is, yeah, there, yeah no. Uh, and, like, uh, honestly, I, I feel that the odds of the Flames selecting a defenseman in the first round are close to zero unless a guy like Brant Clark falls, which there's no reason why he should um so yeah it i i would be shocked frankly if the flames went d in the first round just because there's just not that otherness that you need like balamaki had those skills where you know if he hits then he could be a top pairing defenseman i just don't see any of that otherness that could lead to that upper I, I think tier. the best players available in that area are forwards yeah definitely or goaltenders, because there are two good ones. Well, let's talk about another forward. This is uh, Fedor Svechkov. He's an 18-year-old. He can play wing or center. Six foot, 179 pounds from Russia. Played in the KHL last year. Uh, he's rated everywhere from 15th to 30th. Sometimes the Russian guys fall in the rankings because we know that sometimes they don't. You know, we have issues bringing them over from Europe. Um, you're not worried about that with with this player. Uh, the Flames have been drafting some Russian players of late, so my Usually concern... not this high, though. It's yeah. one thing to lose your your sixth-round pick. It's another to lose your first-round pick. Well, uh, they took uh, one uh, Kuznetsov last year in the second round and a third-round guy the year before. So um, it's one of those things that uh, with uh, Svechkov, uh, he, his offensive game is not spectacular um he's very much a defensive uh center and he has a very good shot though um so he looks like what uh a lot of people were thinking with michael backland when he was drafted and uh i could see his trajectory being in a similar mold he's not an overly tall player he's just a good center that should play a shutdown role. He played in the uh, VHL last year. KHL is coming here, and I think that could be a benefit for him is knowing he's playing in a high-end league. He'll get a good evaluation. Yeah, again, is this the best pick for number 12? No. But if the Flames are really high on this player specifically, I could see them trading down to get additional picks in very much the same way they did with Connor Zari. Um, I just don't see why they'd be high on this pick. Like, he just seems okay. Yeah. And and I think he might honestly be higher because the Russian League played last year and he could be evaluated. Like, I wonder in a regular season if this player is as high as he's rated now or if it's just because we could see him. Yeah, I could see that. And he might, if the Flames were picking 24th, 25th, sure. But I, I'm not really too sure with picking 12th that this would be the best guy available. Well, let's talk about here a uh, another defenseman. Uh, a defenseman from Regina who actually played in the AJHL for Brooks last year. So close to home for us. This is Corson Kuhlemans. He's uh, signed to go to the University of Wisconsin in the NCAA next year. He's a six foot two defenseman, 201 pounds, 18 years old, like I said, from Regina, projected to go everywhere from 12th through 34th, I and mean, even 39th I'm seeing here. Um, smashed has him at 51. So player that, again, people are all over with. It's hard scouting the AHL in a year like this, and I think that's probably why he's all over the board. Yeah, um, again, another okay defenseman, um, not really a ton to say, he's uh, projectable, um, like his season last year, uh, he had 35 points in 44 games in the AJHL, which is decent, and he had 11 this year in 8 games, so, you know, there's a lot of potential, but, uh, yeah, it's very much in the same mold as, um, Edvinson where with his size being 6'2", 200, um, and he's a right-handed shot, I think that would lend more to him making the NHL 
uh, just with his overall aspect. Uh, he's a fluid skater, a decent shot, lots of everything, but not any, again, anything in spectacular fashion. He could be a number three, four guy if he hits. I talked to somebody I know who uh, lives in Brooks and has seen the Brooks team, obviously not during COVID, but before that. And he said, this guy is very much what he would classify a, a prototypical defensive defenseman. He's good at boxing players out. He's good at, you know, threat detection and attaching himself to the guy he thinks is the most dangerous forward. But he said that he makes a lot of mistakes and he plays kind of a reckless game and that that might be his downfall going pro if he can't clean that up. And when I heard that, it sort of reminds me of Sam Bennett, who, you know, would always take penalties when he get frustrated. And so he said that this guy's going to need a little bit more mental uh, conditioning before he could be a really good, a uh, really good pro. Yeah, and that's where like uh, him going to the NCAA. I could see him being a three, four year guy there to work on all those aspects. Like I, I would not expect him until his NCAA career is done, um, before making the NHL. And even then, I think he might need a year or two in the A. I think which I he, think Kuhlman is a long. I think he's a long-term guy, probably four years NCAA, AA, three, four years AHL. Like, I think this is a guy who, you know, is 24, 25 for he's, he's, he's an NHL rank. Yeah, and that's fine, but uh, is that the best use of 12? No. So, We're that's why to... I, don't, I don't think that the Flames are going to take a defenseman in the first round, even though the Flames really need to take some defensemen. It's just, I think they're, they're, especially in the second and third rounds and beyond, uh, it just makes a lot more sense to utilize picks there for I'm that. I'm even anticipating like four, five, six, seven, all, or I guess we don't have four, but like five, six, seven, all defensemen. Yeah, I can see that too. Because we just need some bodies in that position, and the Flames have been good at drafting depth as well. So I, I can see them, yeah, I can see us taking some defensemen late. But I think first round, I know there's some good goalies there, and we'll talk about it once we're done this list. But I think it's got to be a forward. Yeah, um, well, like I, I could see the Flames going like forward or goalie first round, then like defenseman, 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 like last year, and then random uh, high skill, risky forwards after that, like which has been their mo for a number of years. Uh, just to see if they can't get some offensive skill late and, you know, go that route. But So we've talked about the guys sort of on the fringe that we might take at 12. The next group here, we'll do the uh, we'll do the forwards first, and then we'll come back to the goalies. But the, f- the next forwards here, I think, are the guys that you'll likely see the Flames probably taking at 12. And we'll start, start with uh, Loven... Logan Stankoven, he's, uh, f- or yeah, Logan Stankoven, number 11 on the Kamloops Blazers last year. Uh, he's an 18 year old, 5'8, 170 pounds. Uh, he's rated to go everywhere from 19th through 44th. Um, you really like this player, it sounds like. Yeah, he's very much uh, your prototypical short skilled guy, um, like Debrinkit, like Yamamoto, uh, like Beauvillier really skilled guy um it would be hard to get a better skilled guy um in this draft but he's also five foot eight and that's where the a bit of the riskiness if the flames wanted to trade down a couple of picks and get him and like the teams that are between 12 and say 15 aren't uh, going to take him, I could see that being a possibility. Especially, I mean, we haven't shied right away from small guys in the past. No, but uh, at twelve, I think it it's slightly high. But um, you know, like there are teams I'm sure that uh, might like one of the other players and the Flames. If that this is their guy, they might be able to add some uh, additional. Um, assets just for you know more lottery I, picks later in the draft i don't see logan being available in uh at pick 44 i think he'll go in the no. top 31 but i just i i i, uh, I, I can even, see the flames I, take him just because they've had success with small guys in the past yeah like i don't see him uh making it past uh pick 20 
frankly. Like, I think that uh, he'll be one of the better, higher picks in this draft. Um, and I think in a year where teams are willing to take a flyer, I could see him going high because somebody might say, hey, let's just let's give it a try. Yeah, and, you know, he is a right shot right winger. Um, so that would – and he can score. So both of those things are – hugely important for the flames uh so like organizationally it definitely fills a need uh but on top of it he is one of the most rawly skilled players in this draft i would be frankly shocked if he got past the edmonton oilers at number 19 in the draft yeah i think you're probably right some in the top 20 i mean there's not the guy who i think is going to fall outside of let's say worst case scenario he doesn't get taken by 20 he doesn't fall out of 31 no, definitely not. Um, but, yeah, I think this is a guy we either take at 12 or, like you said, if we really like him, we could trade down. But you've got to take him, if you're going to do it, if you want him, somewhere in the first round. Yeah. The next player, another forward uh, that that you liked here, this is another guy you put on our list, Kent Johnson. He primarily plays um, center. He was going to the University of Michigan next year. He played for the Trail Smoke Eaters, one of the weirdest team names in the BCHL last year. He was their alternate captain. Um, he's from North Van and shoots left, centerman. Expect to go anywhere from number eight all the way down to number, uh, again, expect to be high, number 14. So what do you think about Johnson? Uh, Johnson is your prototypical fast, skilled offensive player um he basically is um the uh more uh developed version of if you look at like what andrew majapani is at, in terms of like skill assets as an 18 year old with like that kind of a profile where like you're looking at like a first second line forward that's basically what Ken Johnson is. For a guy to project that high playing in the BCHL tells you something special there. Yeah. You know, normally guys are playing in any JHL, AJHL, BCHL, they generally go uh, lower because you haven't been able to compare them to as high an end talent. Yeah. Uh, he's very fast, which um, – the flames could definitely use and like that's where i would put johnson ahead of guys like sillinger and most of the other forwards is i've heard he a had... lot of people say he's one of the most complete looking forwards in this draft yeah and uh, that's why i would be somewhat surprised if he slipped past like six or seven like uh, honestly this is who i'm expecting uh steve eiserman to take at number six so yeah that's... And, and that's i think that's my thing is i i would love johnson but i don't think we're gonna get johnson and he's not worth trading up for but no. i don't think i don't think there's i can't see any way he falls to 12 yeah like to me that this is a player that screams steve eiserman draft pick yeah johnson's your best case scenario but it's not gonna happen yeah it's sort of like a couple of years ago when we were doing our profile of the valimaki draft year and like I was talking about like how much I liked Elias Pettersson and he ended up because he was rated around where the Flames were picking and ended up getting picked fifth overall and you know it very much a similar feel with Kent Johnson rated a little bit lower but I think he's gonna go way higher than expected for sure yeah I think I think you're right I, I could even see Johnson going in the top I could see a scenario where he goes in the top five. I think somebody that might like him enough, they take yeah, him high. Same here. Yeah. Um, but the next guy I think is a, is a very viable flames uh, pick and that's Fabian LaSalle. Uh, he's a 18 year old right winger, right shot, five ten, 172 pounds from Sweden. Uh, he's been playing in Sweden his whole career and last year played in the SHL. So a men's league over there in 26 games, he had three points. Uh, I know that LaSalle is a guy that you're interested in. What do we know about him? He's basically Kent Johnson, uh, except uh, he doesn't have quite as much offensive production in the SHL. Um, he, that he, That's basically the difference. Like it, He has scored very well at every other level. But if we put Kent Johnson in the SHL from the BCHL, I'm not sure he'd be a high scorer either. 
No, and, and that's where I think that some people might look at um johnson's stats as like oh this guy's really amazing and whereas like oh this guy only had three points in 26 mm -hmm. games and as much as stats shouldn't matter to some people they do and i think that that might be the main difference between them because as far as players in a draft year these two are as interchangeable as i've ever seen in terms of type size how they play how they all their raw skills it's virtually like the sedin twins in terms of you know like they, there's a lot of overlap between these two players the cells projected to go as high as third and as low as uh 27th by different groups craig button thinks he's 27th um bob mckenzie thinks he's 12th i've seen him at 12th in a lot of rankings for me and matt you were saying you know he's not getting great stats in the shl I don't follow them closely, but I can't think of a single 18-year-old who's putting up great numbers over there. It's a men's league. Yeah, exactly. So I I would, if if I was picking, I would probably go for the guy I've seen play adult hockey in LaSalle over the guy who's playing in the BCHL in Johnson. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And and also the me, fact he's a right-wing right shot, I think, is, is yeah, huge for the players. For me, this would be my selection of like any of these players if this guy's name's on the board this is who i take and I, I i go running to the the stage and you know call the name like that's how like very enthusiastic about this particular player knowing so. you, you'd probably like hide behind the stage as soon as your turn you just peek through the curtain and lasell yeah uh. or or just give like a weird stare you know like you know who i'm picking. i don't need to say his name you know who i'm taking Yep. <laughs> um, but I, and as much as you're saying you would take him, I think it's very viable. He's available as well. Yeah, exactly. It's put it this way: if that's who the Flames end up taking, it, it would make entire sense, mm -hmm. both in terms of need. He's fast, skilled, dynamic, and yeah, it, it just everything slots into this makes sense territory for the Flames. So that and he should be available when the flames pick so that's kind of where i'm going um the only other like if he's available and the flames go a different direction the only realistic way i could see it is if like a guy like dylan gunther falls ken johnson falls or they go with one of the goalies yeah and you know i mean I'm not saying they would do this, but if you if Johnson falls and LaSalle's on the board, I know that the Flames want to make some moves this season. That might be the time you try to move, say, a, a Monaghan or somebody to get back into the first, depending on if you feel you need the roster player or not. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, there's options there, but I wouldn't do that move, but I could see Tree doing something. Yeah. Um, if, if LaSalle's not available, the next player on the list, a guy I added to our list, uh, is a guy I, I could see the Flames take in another Swede. Um, he plays in the SHL as well, and this is Isaac Rosen. He's an 18-year-old from Stockholm, 5'11", 161 pounds, left shot, can play left or right defense. Um, he's been described as a highly skilled uh, playmaker with strong skating skills, a strong shot and elite puck skills, a true playmaker with very technical skills and exceptional at reading the game. And to me, I like LaSalle better as an overall player, but if LaSalle's not available, this guy's projected to go between about 12th and 20th. I think that Rosen would be a, another good pick. Yeah. Um, in a very similar ish fashion of a, smaller in this case a left shooting winger he can play either side uh fast skilled you know very much in the same all three of those guys are all basically the same jelly mold of player um so it, you know I take LaSalle over Rosen I take Johnson over LaSalle I think but if LaSalle and Johnson are gone I take Rosen yeah uh if that that's the case, I would probably go goaltender. Um, well, let's talk about the goalies then. 
There's yeah. two goalies that are on the list. Two guys that are projected to go in the first. It's been a long time since Flames have taken a goalie in round one. Last time was Brent Cron, and after that, the highest goalie we took was a second rounder in Mason uh, McDonald. No, Leland Irving, 16th overall. Was he first round? Yeah, yep. 16th okay, overall. Okay, so, so, so between Cron, Irving, and then uh, McDonald in the second round, we're not doing well with high goalie and, picks. And, and Tyler Parsons, too. So, because he's kind of not been very good. So, 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 what that means then, if we draft one of these guys, they're going to get hurt in the AHL. Um, Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> but let's let's talk about them. Let's talk about actually first the Canadian, uh, Sebastian Casa. He's uh, he's from Hamilton, Ontario. Eighteen year old, six foot six goaltender, two twelve, and plays for the Edmonton Oil King. So, if we can stomach having the guy who plays in Edmonton, he could be a good player for us. Uh, what do you like about Casa as a goaltender? Um, imagine Jacob Markstrom, and that's basically Sebastian Costa. Um, in terms of play style, size, uh, everything, it's... He's projected pretty, to go between about 15th and 25th. Yeah, um, uh, Costa is... Uh, you can see that he mirrored a lot of his game and how he approaches the game off of watching Jacob Markstrom because... There is a lot of similarity between the two. And with his size and mobility, you have to figure that Casa will be an NHL goaltender. And he's been really good at the WHL level. Um, again, uh, this would be a lot... Both of the goalies would be a longer term, like four or five years before a starter. And yes, the Flames have Dustin Wolf, but you know until you get that legit mm -hmm. guy uh, you have to keep giving up picks to get good prospects in until you get that guy and best case scenario is you two of them hit and then you get to choose but uh you know it, it's one of those things that if um one of the dynamic forwards is not on the board um between johnson or lasalle and one of the two goalies is on I definitely go that route. Um, just well, let's because, talk about the other goalie then. Uh, Jesper Wallstead is um, rated higher on the list. I uh, expected to go in the top six, actually. Yeah, a lot of people and, have said he's probably top ten for sure. Yeah, and uh, I, from what I've seen of him, full marks. Like uh, any of the t like, honestly, I, I'm kind of penciling him in um, to either fourth or uh, to sixth. Uh, for either New Jersey or Detroit uh, because they both could use a young goaltender. So Jesper um, Wallstad's an 18-year-old Swede. Uh, he's six foot three, 214 pounds, like Matt said, expect to go in the top 10. He also played in the SHL, so men's league, uh, where he played last year and also in 2019-2020. So I, I think hoping that we're going to get Wallstad is, uh, is maybe a bit of a dream. I don't think there's any way he falls 12. Yeah, if he's available on 12, then uh, who cares who the forwards are? Go with the goalie. Yeah, but, I mean, can you really see a scenario where he falls to 12? It's like saying no. if, if Luke Hughes or Owen Powers is available, of course you take him, right? Yeah, exactly. But weird things would have to happen for, you know. And it's just like if Mason McTavish or uh, William Eklund or Dylan Gunther fell I, I think like, every, yeah, sure, every but... team wants a goalie. I think that there's a lot of teams that would happily take this goaltender. Yeah, exactly. And same with Casa. Like they're getting good goaltending is hard. Um and most teams just have serviceable goaltenders. And so when you have guys like Casa or Wallstead who look like they're going to be at least above an average nhl goaltenders like that is the most important position in the nhl period and you look at vasilevsky like as much as like the rest of tampa was good um they don't get to the stanley cup finals if vasilevsky doesn't shut the door on the islanders and mm -hmm. you know uh it was literally the one guy who st stood tall in that game and you know, and he shut Montreal down, and the, there that is the difference um, between being a playoff team and a Stanley Cup contender or champion is having that level of goaltending, and and that's why I don't know. think he'll fall to twelfth. Yeah, 
Uh, I can uh, see Costa being available at 12th. I can't see Wolfstead. Yeah. Now, the Flames on, uh, specifically, because Wolf is good, it, there's a little less emphasis where, like, if they can get one of the dynamic Swedish forwards, I think you go that route first. But if the two Swedish guys are gone, I think that the next best thing is going with Sebastian Casa. Yeah, I'd, I mean, goalies are always a longer-term project. I, I can't remember many goalies that, you know, have had, let's say, come in the league, you know, without playing AHL time and been really successful. There's been a few, but especially in the last little bit, most goalies that are making it to the league and being successful are older guys, mid-20s coming in. Um, so I think either way, these guys have a long, especially in a, in a market like Calgary where we have – um, I, I still think the Flames would want to try out some of their HL guys. We've got Wolf coming in. We've got a bunch of goalies in the system who are good enough. And with Markstrom signed long term, you don't need these guys right away. So I think Costa makes sense if you're looking for your maybe next guy. But at the same time, I think how many top goaltenders now have been taken in the first round? Like a lot of them are depth guys two through seven. I would rather use the the pick on a forward this year, especially in sort of a crapshoot year, and go for the big goalie in the future. And that's understandable. It, this one, this year's draft is frankly bizarre. Um, so as long as they don't go like off the board and do something weird and take a guy that's just not good, uh, like Aturati, then you know, things are fine. <laughs> um, it's just, uh, yeah, it, it, it's one of those situations, like, with the Flames and their goaltending situation, like, you, if the Flames, say, did draft Casa, like, you have to figure he's going to play the two remaining years in juniors, so that would leave three years left on Markstrom's contract. Then he's probably going to get a year at a minimum in the AHL, probably two so like markstrom's contract is basically coming to a close and then casa would be backing up uh markstrom in the last year or two depending uh of that and just as like markstrom's getting depending ready you to see markstrom on. a playing out the deal and b being the starter for all of it yeah, exactly. I really so, think you've got two, maybe three more years of Markstrom as a starter before he's backing up a young a young guy. Yeah, exactly. So it's one of those things where, you know, I, like, especially, like, if the Flames are kind of going into more of a retool for where they're at right now, um, it kind of makes more sense to go goaltender. Um because then, like, the current crop of forwards, like uh, Goudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm, that's not the guys that you're really building around. It's Kachuk, uh, Dubé, um, Peltier, those kind of guys, Manjapane. Um, that's your group. And so, like, you're hoping that the goalie would be ready for when that group's, like, uh, on the ascension, like, in four or five years. And again, I mean, I'm not saying they shouldn't take Casa, but I just don't see the urgency to take a goalie in the first. I think that no. when I look and, at when I look at our need, there's I would even this year take a defenseman over the goalie. I think we have enough we have enough goaltenders in the system. We can muddle our way through that position for a couple of years, even if it means bringing in veteran backups. I think that we really need to get forwards and defensemen, especially defensemen, in the system this year. Yeah. Uh, the only reason why I'm more deferring to going um, with the goalie, provided the couple of good forwards are gone, is just mainly due to the fact the guy's six foot six, um, and you know very projectable in that manner. So um, we'll see. Um, Again, it's one of those situations where Mason McDonald is six four, and where is he now? Yeah, but uh, the difference is is that um, Casa is actually good. Um, so 
the yeah <laughs> mcdonald was very much a tactically uh, sound uh positionally sound guy who didn't really have like he was always in the right spot he just didn't know how to catch or block the puck which i haven't you know, seen enough of costa to answer this question but i wonder if he would be in the top 15 in a regular year or if he was there and and if, based on what i'm seeing here just looking at beginning of season mid-season and end of season rankings it looks like his stock went up because he was playing yeah um well he's also was uh like he had good stats last year and the year before and then he repeated it again, the good stats again for the for little sure. Bit but that even he played, good stats so. though don't often project a goaltender into the top fifteen. No, again, this year's draft is kind of mediocre though. So the Flames are basically at like the exact right position in this draft, uh, picking eleventh, where they're with there being eight good players that should go in the top eight that if any of them fall you're close enough where that can happen and the the you basically have like the top tier of the next group at your disposal and you know it's basically what you're looking for specifically at that point so you know like ken johnson and uh um fabian lysel would be at the top of um like nine ten on my list but uh you know then you've got the goalies you know right there at like seven eight so and let's, then 12, let's say you've got and beyond so. lysel and uh and casa do you take the winger or do you take the goaltender hmm that's a tough one i think based on where the flames are at and again projecting out four or five years the right shot winger i think is the more valuable asset for this team yeah like um Lysel to me is the more likely to make the NHL right away. Um, I only see him as like a second line winger if he hits, which is fine. Every uh, team needs um, second line winger. Yeah, um, but um, it's one of those where it depends. Basically, the more important thing to me is uh, where. The, like what exactly this flames team is doing uh moving forward like are they basically well, you've said in the past out, if you were the gm you'd try to re retool this team so if you're retooling yeah. which way do you go goalie and if you're not retooling you go with the forward yeah okay i would go with the forward either way i think the lysel has better upside and i think someone you'll see a return on i'm not convinced that casa gets the return from a first round pick and i can understand that it how would you say um where the flames were picking as well like with the 11th pick um let's say i think you could get the same return from casa in a guy that you could get in two through seven i don't think you could get the same return from lysel in a guy two through seven if that makes sense yeah i agree so i, uh, I think from it, that respect it, i'd take lysel yeah it would be a gamble, um, but especially with this particular draft year, if you, you know, like in a normal draft year, I would definitely go forward, um, like regardless. Um, but with this year being a little bit bizarre um, all the way around, I, I, you know, um, goalies, to me, it's hard how would you say it's easier for a forward or a defenseman to kind of fake how good they are um in like overperform um like in, especially in a situation where like you're only playing 15 20 games like you know you could just have a good hot streak at the right time and oh you're awesome no you're not but even then uh, I, I look at those two and I look at Lysel and even Rosen who I like who are playing in the Swedish men's league where I think it's it's a lot harder to fake your stats than yeah. say the the Western League. Yeah. And the goalies though um just to carry on with the point that I was going to make, the goalies like it's harder to because like you're basically the last line of defense mm -hmm. where you know and regardless of the talent on your team or the other team uh you know like you're <laughs> gonna be facing things and a lot of 
well, your stats are your own. Um, well, and sometimes so, the best goalie stats are the guys in the worst teams, too. Yeah, so we'll see. Uh, it, put it this way, if the Flames draft Ken Johnson, Fabian Lysel, Jesper Wallstad, um, or uh, Sebastian Casa, to me, any of those four guys or any of the top eight guys that go in the are supposed to go in the top eight if any of that permutation happens and that's who the flames pick is one of those four names then i I feel like this draft has been successful in what it could be for right where we are now i think you're right and based on yeah the pandemic and everything that we have going into this draft i think you're right and then two through seven i think we just got to bulk up like you said on defensemen yeah and then whatever miscellaneous skill guys regardless of position that you can throw a chance at and if you don't get the the goaltender in the first you've got to take one somewhere as you always say take a goalie every year yeah it's just like last year with them getting chechelev perfect pick for where they got it you know and if they find another guy in a miscellaneous league like they did with chechelev great awesome yeah, you know, well, and, and we've we'll and see. we've done well with bringing in goalies from not spending draft picks on them, but bringing in some more senior goalies too. With um, you know Riddick, we did that. We brought him in from Europe, and you know he was Red Obara. Uh, Red Obara, um, who's the guy right now that we have in AHL? Um, uh, Zagadulin. Zagadulin. So that's another option too: is not spend the pick on the goalie and find the goalie in some other league as a free agent. Yep. So. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what they do. But to me, I think again, looking realistically, not the guy I want, but the guy I think is realistic. I think Lysel's the best choice. I think Rosen's a good choice. Um, I can see why Casa would be a good choice, and I wouldn't be upset if the Flames took him. He's not the guy I would take. Yeah, exactly. And you know, like it, it would be different, like if they went off the board and like selected Zachary Laharu because oh, he's a physical guy. You know, or something like that, which that you could go that route, but it wouldn't make any sense. And, you know, like there's lots of permutations where if the flames go in a different direction entirely, it's like, um, what is it that you're seeing? What do you think the likelihood is that we walk into this draft with seven picks and we walk out making less than seven picks? Uh, I think that uh, the flames would probably only add draft picks that's what i think too yeah like i i don't see the need to trade up tree well not even trade up but trade out like trees traded first and second for roster players in the past so i guess what do you think the the likelihood is that we trade a pick for an immediate need zero i just think like you said earlier this year there's not going to be a great deal of value in these picks yeah like honestly i I don't even think with pick 11 it's technically 12, 12 but arizona forfeiting the 11th pick um like even that like i don't see you being able to get a like a, a fourth defenseman uh just because of how screwed up this year's draft is so, i think and i think if the flames are going to make a move for the caliber player that they would do with a first i think they can make that caliber move with other assets this year exactly and at least like you say like you know what dylan dubé is so like if you're wanting to make a trade for like using a first equivalent asset well a, a dylan dubé you could swap dubé monahan Backlund. Yeah. there's lots of assets this team could move if they wanted to yeah exactly and, and i think too if you think and they'll know by that point but if you've lost your dano you don't have the money to go buy that asset and give up nothing. Yeah. And, you know, as uh, weird as it is, losing uh, Derek Ryan, uh, Sam Bennett, and uh, uh, David Riddick, that frees up $10 million. And, you know, those are f- two fourth-line players and a backup goalie. You can fill that for, like, $2 million in a bit. And, you know, if you're using young guys... And then roll with, um, 
you know the extra six seven million on and that a uh, thing that you need so if you get the 6.75 and the 6 million or so that you'll get from the other you know like that's two good forwards or a good forward and a good defenseman that you can just go and buy in free agency and you know and another guy to add to the four good forwards that the flames have and another good defenseman so you know like there are lots of permutations to I think it, without really doing a huge. I think swap another over. interesting wrinkle is there seems to be a lot more guys getting bought out than I expected, at least. And I'm not saying we'd want to touch those guys, but if you're looking for veteran help, I think there's going to be a lot of guys that just got a lot of money to go away, and you might be able to bring in for cheap. Yeah, like honestly, just saying, like if the Flames went out and signed Zach Parise and Ryan Suter. Uh, Prize to be on the third line and uh, Suter to be like the number three four defenseman and say for like five million between them sure awesome bring them aboard we'll talk yeah. more about that when we get past the draft and we talk about free agency but yeah I just I don't see the need to where I'm bringing this back to is I don't see the need to move a pick I, I can see him adding picks but I can't see the reason to move one of those seven picks for an asset yeah, I agree. So I, I think we'll make at least seven picks this year. Yeah. I mean, I could see them, say, trading the third for, you know, I could see them trading one of their thirds for a fourth this year and a fifth next year or something and adding a pick. But, yeah, I can't see them making less than seven picks in this year's draft. Yeah. Uh, I could see them trading down at various spots, yeah, even I from 11. Too. You know, like, say they have a list that's 10 names long and all 10 are gone. And the guy that they have between 11 and, say, 14, they have rated very similarly. Uh, then, yeah, by Oof. all means, pull out Connor Zari and just. Well, that's it. We down. saw that last year where Tree traded. His guy was still available and traded again. Like, yeah, I could, I could even see. I could see the Flames go as low as 20 in the first. Yeah. I the can't see him trading lower than 20 because I think you get into a different caliber player. But I think there's a whole bunch of guys between. 10 and 20 that you know what if you're getting enough asset for doing it it might be worth getting a slightly lesser player now to add another defenseman or something like that yeah well like say the flames uh a team that's say picking 15th or 16th really wants the 12th pick um and they're wanting to throw their second round pick in you know and Even their third you know it, it's like that's worth it mm -hmm. you know um so it, we'll see and you know i it, how would you say like on the draft floor you kind of know who everybody's taking yeah uh because like that's why uh Trilliving they're doing, they're down doing it through zoom again though right yeah but like even then they know like who everybody's going to take. Like I think it's probably a little bit harder because you're not all in the same place. But yeah, you're right. I think that everyone has a sense of that, and they've been talking enough to know that. Yeah, because you just do, and like I think, like especially with uh, like who uh, is calling you up to make the trade, you're asking them. Well, who are you taking for yeah. one? Because well, no, I, we want that guy. So no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, and I or, think especially as you've been talking trade and that sort of thing, you're getting a sense of what team needs are, who do you like. Um, I just think there might be a little less certainty this year because I think a lot of teams may change their draft order after they lose a guy in the expansion. Yeah, I could see that too. So I think you might have a little less certainty on that this year than you have in the past, especially because they're so close together. Mm -hmm. Well, yep. Matt, that, that wraps up this episode, our pre-drafts episode. Usually we have a pre-draft, but this is before both the expansion and the entry draft. So you and I will chat again after the entry draft, and we'll talk about whatever an asset is the Flames lose in the expansion draft and whatever assets the Flames gain in the entry draft. Yeah, and normally when we're doing this, we tend to talk more about like the second round and beyond with specifics in mind of, like, oh, this player or that player but this year it being everything up in the air like honestly from pick the second round pick on uh, none of it i i do not 
expect any of the draft lists to even come close to the actual draft. Uh, and I think you're going to see random ball picks and guys that are rated in the top 40 getting picked in the fourth round uh, because things are just going to be all up in the air. But what we will do is we'll talk about the players the Flames do end up taking so that we get some idea of who's going to be um, you know, who's going to be coming and, and what to expect from those players. So while we can't, you know, project them, we'll talk about whatever player the yep. Flames actually pick. Yep. So as always, uh, we want to hear from you guys. If you're listening to this and you think that we've gone wrong with our uh, our 7 3 and 1 predictions for the expansion draft, and you think there's a way to save Giordano and not lose the top young forward, or maybe there's a guy you like better in the entry draft, let us know. Hit us up. Uh, we're on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast on Twitter. Facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. Um, those are the two best places. We also have an Instagram. We're Fireside Chat underscore podcast on Instagram. Or go to our website and comment on this uh, on this episode or use our contact form and let us know what you think. But we'd love to hear if you guys think uh, somebody different in the draft or, again, maybe there's a way to save the captain and, uh, and get out of this in a way that we haven't looked at. But let us know what you think. Matt, I think that about does it for us. We'll be back probably next week to talk about everything that happens. Yeah. And, you know, before we sign off, I just have to say that it would have been nice if um, Montreal had gotten swept by Vegas and then Vegas got swept by Tampa, just so that way Edmonton would have lost consecutively to everybody who got swept afterwards. But, you know... I think you've old... had a, too long an off season to be thinking this through. Yeah, well, you know, it's been a long year. The Flames have not been very good, and so I've had to keep my mouth shut about the Oilers. Because for once, they actually, you know, made the playoffs. You know, and this season, to their credit, was their second best season in the last 31 years. And then they got swept by Winnipeg, so... Uh, that's all I need to say. <laughs> well, there you go. With that, do you want to sign us off, Matt? As always, Edmonton's... Oh, wait, no. Um, can't go Flames, go. <laughs> Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.